Lam, the first woman to be the chief executive of Hong Kong's special administrative region, will end her five-year term this year. She says the experience, particularly the social turmoil in 2019, has steeled her to face any new challenge that may come her way. As we enter the new year, how does she evaluate the journey the city and she herself has gone through in 2021? Will she seek a second term? And what challenges does she see in the new year for the SAR? Welcome to this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin, coming to you from Beijing. I'm pleased to be joined from Hong Kong by Chief Executive Carrie Lam. Carrie, Happy New Year and welcome to The Point. Happy New Year to you, Liu Xin. Thank you so much. As a woman, I have a burning question I always wanted to ask you since this is finally the opportunity. I often see you wearing a Chinese Chi Pao style dress with a Western jacket over it. What is the message you try to give? Well, that's a very interesting question, Liu Xin. Uh, that was not intended to send any particular message. But I would say that I picked up uh, wearing uh, Chi Pao when I was sent by the uh, governments who had a London office. Uh, that was almost 17 years ago. So I told myself that uh, in a foreign uh, place uh, where I would be attending a lot of functions and events representing Hong Kong, China. So perhaps the, the first uh, image to give to my counterparts is I, I come from China. Mm -hmm. so I'm wearing something which is uh, very easily associated with the Chinese culture. Mm. So that was the origin of my wearing Qi Pao. And I have this habit over these years. And you know, I'm sure you know, a Qi Pao has to be tailor-made. Right. Uh, and because I'm so busy, I just don't have enough time. So for the, the overcoat, the jacket, I just, uh, I just bought it off the shelf. <laughs> but uh, since you raised it, I would just relate it to uh, the uniqueness of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very unique uh, city in the whole of the People's Republic of China, exactly because we are the place mm. where the East meets the West. Right. So whether in our uh, culture, in even our cuisine, uh, the language we speak, we have the benefit of both worlds. So Absolutely. I'm extremely pleased that in the 45 year plan promulgated last March, the central authorities have recognized our role uh, as the uh, cultural hub where the East meets the West. Absolutely. I hope the city is able to retain that special uh, flavor to it. And uh, certainly you look very nice with the Chi Pao inside and uh, Western jacket <laughs> outside. And that's inspiring, as you can tell. I'm wearing that today. Yes, thank <laughs> uh, you. But OK, I know you have a very busy schedule and you just had another press conference this morning. And uh, yes. I think COVID is one of the top uh, priorities. So Hong Kong uh, reported its first Omicron. Uh, outbreak or case in December 31st and you said this morning that uh, that will certainly have an impact on the ongoing discussions yes. with the mainland authorities yes. on resuming some normal travel so could you tell us a little bit more about uh, whether there is a timetable or is the timetable still on schedule to reopen border with the mainland well, well, first of all Hong Kong is so closely linked to the mainland of China so almost um, everyone in Hong Kong longs to go into the mainland of China without being subject to quarantine or what we said that resuming some normal trouble. Mm. So since we put out the fourth wave, which started in November 2020, by the middle of last year, we have more or less cleared up um, COVID-19 cases uh, in our community. So uh, with the strong support of the central government, uh, from September onwards, we have a series of meetings between the experts, between the health officials on both sides, between the um, customs people, in order to prepare for a gradual and orderly resumption of normal travel between Hong Kong and the mainland. I would say that we were actually very close to an announcement that uh, travel could resume. Hmm. Uh, but unfortunately, we have this uh, imported um, Omicron case and then spread it into the community. But I can say that uh, so far we have been uh, controlling very well. Uh, yes, we have over 100 confirmed Omicron cases, but um, all of them are either imported or associated epidemiologically with an imported case. We have not yet had really a local case mm. of Omicron that was infected locally, so mm. to speak. 
So I hope that after maybe um, a couple of weeks, uh, when we have no longer have those uh, cases, then we could pick up what we have already prepared and um, be ready to announce uh, a resumption of travel. You also said this morning that only vaccinated people would be allowed into venues such as gyms, cinemas or libraries in Hong Kong from February the 24th. Will the rule stay or even expand more venues? Well, we will do it in a gradual and orderly manner. Uh, the fact is uh, we have um, commenced vaccination last February, so for almost one year now. And the vaccination rate has um, not significantly uh, improved in recent months, particularly with the elderly. Hmm. Uh, with the adult population, we, overall, we have done over 70%. I think it's about 72%. But for the elderly, it's only half of that 72%. It's less than 40% for those aged 70 and above. And we all know that they are the more vulnerable when they were being infected. So we really have to give this uh, vaccination uh, a boost or a push. So uh, I have announced that uh, from the 24th of February, will we impose the vaccination requirements on more venues. So people who want to go into these venues, uh, they have to be vaccinated, either the first dose or a full vaccination of two doses. Mm. At the moment, uh, what I have announced is they will be applied to places which are prescribed under regulation. So basically the uh, restaurants and other um, uh, outlets and, and, and also the uh, uh, gyms and cinemas, um, I would not rule out to extend it to more places. In fact, we have put our own premises, which are not subject to uh, the sort of regulation under this requirement from the middle of February as an employer. So governor's employer has already told our employees that from the middle of February, if you want to go to work in a government office, you have to get vaccinated. Mm. A very important message, of course, was given by the Chinese President Xi Jinping when he delivered the, the new address for 2022 on TV. And he said this about Hong Kong. He said that the prosperity and stability of Hong Kong and Macau, of course, are always mm. close to the heart of the mainland. Only with the unity and concerted efforts can we ensure sound Im implementation of one country, two systems in the long run. How do you interpret these remarks? They're very general, right? But how do you see yes. what's in there? Well, the first, um, the first uh, point is if we look at the historical context, uh, the whole idea of uh, doing something which is um, very innovative and unprecedented of allowing two systems to coexist within one country is exactly for the stability and prosperity of Hong Kong. So of course the uh, motherland has the interests of Hong Kong at heart. And then, and hence they introduced this um, one country, two systems to resolve a problem that was left behind by history. Okay, if, if the motherland was, did not care about Hong Kong, there would be no one country, two systems. And now uh, this year is the 25th anniversary of the establishment of Hong Kong SAR. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, in the last two and a half decades, uh, all the things, all the policies that the central government uh, wrote out, um, they have only one important uh, mission, and that is to support Hong Kong's stability and prosperity, including the two very important decisions made recently. One is the enactment and implementation of a Hong Kong national security law. The other is to uh, improve the Hong Kong electoral system to ensure patriots administering Hong Kong. Mm. Both important decisions were not taken lightly, but they have to be taken in light of the actual situation in Hong Kong to give us back prosperity, stability, and to ensure that we will continue to progress on the right track of one country two systems. But I would like to share with you something more personal. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that when this uh, close to the heart, uh, it was to the mainland, to the motherland. Mm. Um, having been the chief executive for four and a half years and having met uh, President Xi Jinping for at least five occasions on my annual duty visit, I would like to tell the people of Hong Kong and also the people in the mainland that uh, Hong Kong's interest and in stability and prosperity is very close to the heart of the president. 
actually, he said exactly more or less the same words when he landed in Hong Kong on the 29th of June 2017 hmm. uh, to take part in the celebration activities and the inauguration of my term of government. And over these four and a half years, uh, I have first-hand experience of how President Xi is concerned about Hong Kong. And every decision I'm sure he made has this uh, very close to his heart mm. uh, uh, element. Mm. And, uh, and for that, I am extremely grateful. And that was also the feeling you got when you visited him uh, very recently this time. Okay. For your year-end press conference, you called 2021 a year of Hong Kong getting more integrated with a national development plan. And for the locals, it's important to know what concrete benefits they have started to enjoy and they will enjoy in the near future. Would you like to share some of, us, uh, some of that with us? And if you look back, what would you have liked to have done to be done differently? Well, um, the, the year 2021 uh, was a very important year because uh, it was the beginning of another five-year plan. This is the 14 5 five-year plan. And of course, Hong Kong appeared in uh, previous five-year plan, starting from the 12 five-year plan. But I would say that in this particular five-year plan, the 14 5 five-year plan, Hong Kong has been given the strongest uh, degree of support uh, from the central government not only in terms of uh, supporting Hong Kong to strengthen and consolidate our position as an international financial trade uh, transportation center, but also upon our request. And I can tell you this is upon uh, our request that the central government in the 14 5 plan said that they would also support Hong Kong to become an international innovation and technology center, an international aviation hub, and the cultural hub where the East meets the West. And as Shenzhen, well as it, Shenzhen is very jealous, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but also in that, uh, in that 14 fire plan, uh, Shenzhen and Hong Kong's collaboration in an area called Shenzhen, Shengang He Tao, the loop, has been put on the platform mm. as one of the four key collaboration in the Greater Bay Area. So with that, I, I hope Shenzhen will be slightly happier. Uh, with the outcome but for because the local concrete, people uh, what concrete list. yeah what concrete benefits did they see for instance in the year 2021 yeah. well, if hong kong people are in the um, sector of financial services they will immediately see the benefits of the central government supporting hong kong through all the stock connect scheme bond connect scheme and uh, boosting hong kong's business as an offshore renminbi center they will have more business uh, similarly, where mainland supports us to be an IPO hub, we are seeing more mainland companies coming to list in Hong Kong, so they will have more business. And this business will uh, spill into the legal side and uh, all the other aspects. And if they are in a creative industry, they will be very happy to see for the first time that um, the country has supported us to be a cultural hub. So in time to come, I'm sure that we will be given more concrete measures on how our uh, cultural uh, performances and, and things like that could go into the mainland, uh, especially in the Greater Bay Area. To answer your question, what more um, or what more well, I would Carrie, like to see? Well, uh, Kerry, I do, I do want to hear a little bit more yeah. about the people who are not in the financial sector, the people yeah. who are not in the cultural or innovative sector, the grassroots, you know, because yeah. this is everywhere in the news, right? The people who are living in very small housing, and this is a big subject. So what, what was for them in 2021? Something the on housing the way. Is, mm -hmm. uh, housing is a local issue. I don't think we can expect um, the central government to help us to find land or to build flats. That is a very local issue. Mm. But by having the uh, improved electoral system, by making our legislative council a more rational forum to work with the executive to roll out policies, I am now much more confident than a couple of years ago in delivering our housing policy. Because previously, if the government wanted to do some reclamation to find land to build flats, the government wants to go into the new territories to resume some rural land to build flats. There will be a lot of objection and resistance. And I can tell you that those objections and resistance very often were driven by an anti-China uh, inference. So if people object to our uh, 
works program because they don't like the design, they don't want the transport, that's fine, we can discuss, we can sit down and discuss. But if every time the objection is because there is a small faction in society that wanted to bash China to resist integration of Hong Kong with the mainland, then it's very difficult for us to do major projects that will produce the land and the housing I, uh, for the passwords in Hong Kong. I understand uh, your point. However, a lot of people would say, uh, don't blame everything on the anti-China uh, forces because after all, there are a small uh, number of the society, although they can, do, they can bring a lot of uh, disruptions. Um, looking back, what do you think could have been done differently if you had a second chance? Well, when it comes to housing, uh, the problem is not in the recent years. Um, one has to go back to history. After 1997, uh, I'm sure you remember, we faced a major Asian financial crisis. And as a result, uh, there's a lot of negative equity. The property prices have dropped by over 40%. So as a re response to that sort of economic and property situation, the then government, I wouldn't say it's rightly or wrongly, but the then government took, had taken a decision to suspend the production of land mm. and to cease the building of flats for sale. And as a result, we have then accumulated all these problems, long waiting lists for housing and flats and can't buy and so on. So it will need time because I could not produce the flats overnight. It needs time to uh, catch up with the housing program. But now I'm far more confident. That's why in my policy address uh, announced three months ago, I announced a major development strategy called the Northern Metropolis. And then we will continue with the uh, artificial island reclamation of the eastern part of Lantau Island. And together with other projects, I have promised the people of Hong Kong in 15, 20 years time, I have over 1 million flats available. That's, and that is only government projects, yeah. but we need time. Yeah. Well, definitely um, a lot of uh, changes are taking place, although changes do take time. But the latest has been the newly elected Legislative Council. The members were only sworn in on the very first yes. working day of the new year, and you administer the oaths, yes. the oath-taking ceremony under the new emblem of the National of uh, the People's Republic of China. How did you feel, and what difference do you think these new terms of legislators can make compared to their predecessors? The oath-taking ceremony was a very solemn one. And it should ha always have been that way because the legislature plays a very important part in Hong Kong's political system and has very important constitutional duties uh, to ensure that Hong Kong will remain stable and prosperous. So I'm very pleased to be able um, to do the oath administration, uh, a duty given to me by law. Now, the difference is so, so remarkable, uh, Liu Xing. I just told you, two years ago, uh, in October 2019, the chief executive, that is myself, I couldn't even stand in the legislative council chamber to deliver my annual policy address. There's so much chaos within the chamber, shouting, fighting, and struggling to the extent that I have to truncate my policy address and subsequently delivered by a video. As the chief executive of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, accountable to the central government and to the people of Hong Kong, I felt very bad and very sad about that occasion. Mm. Now, I could go into the Legislative Council, solemnly uh, administer the oath for the 90 members, and I will go back again next week to deliver a speech. And I will do all the things that should have been done by the chief executive in collaboration with the legislative council. Some people are saying you're able to do that because the great majority of the opposition do not take part in the voting for whatever reason that there, there is. Um, it is true, um, the great majority of the members elected are what we what people were calling the pro-establishment and there was only one that's considered non-pro-establishment. So have you figured out why some people did not go to vote? And how do you make sure, both by specific measure or mechanism, to channel those voices which are not anti-China but simply because they have different ideas about how Hong Kong should be governed better? How are you going to do that? 
Sure. No, exactly. Uh, the uh, the purpose of the improvements to the electoral system is to ensure patriots administering Hong Kong. It is not to return a system that will say yes to everything that the government wants to do. Now, so uh, previously, uh, when people, when politicians are being uh, classified as pro-establishment or pro-democracy, in my view, is not the right way. I think every politician in the Hong Kong SAR should be patriotic and then they can take part in the political system. And once they are in the political system, of course, they, are, they, they can have their free mind. They could criticize our policies. They could be more pro-labor or they could be more pro-business. And then we can sit down rationally to decide and discuss what would be the, in the best interest of Hong Kong. So let me make it very clear that um, uh, we welcome uh, dissenting voices about the government policies. And I certainly uh, feel that with more rational debate and participation of uh, politicians who represent the views of the people, then the policies could be improved. Now, beyond the post, that is um, other means, the government has a lot of uh, channels to uh, collate the opinion of the people. We have statutory process for town planning. We have to do public consultations on major policies. And we have to uh, conduct hearings and inquiries so that people could come in. And we may even have town hall meetings, which I used to attend before mm. all this political chaos happened. Now, coming back to the uh, Legislative Council uh, uh, vote, um, the uh, voting, um, uh, nobody could actually give a, a full answer to explain the uh, turnout rate. Uh, but 30% uh, was not a low figure. Uh, 1.35 million turned out to vote, uh, given the current circumstances. In my view, it's a very important indication of support for the electoral system. And uh, you have to ask the other people who uh, did not vote why they uh, did not vote. But I will not belittle uh, this election and the electoral system, because the 90 members now taking their office, they come from a very uh, a, a broad representation. Uh, they have uh, different views on many of the things, and they, I'm sure that they, they will play their part to monitor uh, the performance of the Hong Kong SEL government. Well, time will tell. Definitely, people will be watching very closely, and including the press, and which is what I'm going to ask now, because press freedom is another uh, very much hot spot issue now. We know uh, the new site, Citizen News, announced that it will be shutting down, allegedly to protect the safety of everyone involved, and there has been criticism of, uh, you know, that uh, pre press freedom is being suppressed in the city. And you said this morning they could not accept claims that press freedom is facing. Yes. Extinction. Uh, could you give us some more example, more evident example as to why Hong Kong still enjoys a very high degree of press freedom? Well, one is um, uh, press freedom is uh, guaranteed and protected under the basic law, like all the other rights and freedoms. And secondly, Hong Kong is a place with the rule of law. So uh, any um, undue interference or uh, unfair treatment of people, you can uh, take us to court if uh, uh, for a judicial review or even uh, for other um, uh, allegations that you have. And thirdly is uh, one only have, ha has to live in Hong Kong and watch the news and read the newspapers and the magazines and you will know what I meant hmm. that there is still a lot of freedom. People could express their opinion, could criticize the government and uh, the policy and attack the chief executive, uh, rightly or wrongly. So this is the, uh, an expression of the freedom of the media. And uh, we have not seen a sort of major exodus of uh, local or overseas media or mainland media represented in Hong Kong. So I, I was giving out the figures that since the enactment of the national security law, as far as the media organizations registered with the information services department of the government in order that they could subscribe our news and receive an invitation to a press conference of an official, the numbers have increased. So how could one say that there is no freedom in Hong Kong? Yeah. Looking ahead, um, you have for sure uh, half a year left. Whether you want yes. to extend that, uh, I'll leave that for just a moment. But uh, what, would, what is your priority then for the next six months? 
Well, at least the priorities will be to continue to fight COVID-19 so that uh, we could resume some uh, normal travel uh, into the mainland. This is the aspiration of the great, great majority of Hong Kong people. Yeah. The second is uh, this year is the 25th anniversary of the reunification. So we have already planned uh, for the celebration uh, with a lot of activities and, and so on. The third is with the new legislative council, it is incumbent upon me as the chief executive to lead my team to cooperate fully uh, with the legislative council and to prove to the people of Hong Kong that now we have a more sensible, rational relationship between the government and the legislature, that we will do good things uh, for the people. So I have already announced uh, 300 initiatives in my policy address, so um, I will use every minute to roll out these policies for the people. That's a lot of work. Wouldn't you want a little bit more time <laughs> to carry out all these grand projects? Uh, I know you brushed aside that question about whether you're going to seek a second term, but tell me by when can we know the exact answer? Uh, the nomination period for the next chief executive uh, election starts on the 15th of February. <laughs> Maybe around that time you will know who who will be contesting in this chief executive election. Okay, so uh, while you were on a duty visit to Beijing in late December, President Xi told you the central authorities fully acknowledged the work by you and the Hong Kong SAR government. But some foreign media have said that Beijing didn't signal support for your second term as chief executive. What is your reaction? The reaction is that that was not the purpose of a trip. The purpose of a trip to Beijing is a duty visit, which I have to do it, uh, any chief executive has to do it on an annual basis. So I think uh, the purpose of that trip has been fully uh, met, that uh, the uh, central government, both the president and the premier, have acknowledged the work of myself and my team in the past year. And I have also uh, reported to them uh, what I intended to do in the, in the next uh, six months, particularly relating to uh, the 14 five year plan and uh, controlling COVID-19 so that we could resume uh, travel. So I, I, I feel very happy uh, having been able to do this trip in person because last year mm -hmm. you may remember sure. that I could only do it uh, on, online. Would you use the word happy to describe your first four and a half years in office as a kind of legacy? No, definitely not. I have gone through some very painful <laughs> days. I would not describe the four and a half years as happy, but I would say that I, I feel gratified that uh, in the past four and a half years, and of course, including the next six months, I, I have played a part. Um, may not be a very major part because most of the important decisions are made by the central uh, authorities, but I have played my part in bringing Hong Kong back onto the right track of one country, two systems, so that uh, Hong Kong's long-term stability and prosperity will have been assured. And that is my greatest satisfaction. Thank you so much, Carrie Lam, and all the very best to you from Beijing. Thank you for having me, Liu Xin. Thank you. And with that, we come to the end of this special edition of The Point with me, Liu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lushin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.